this week I participated on a young minister's Zoom with a uh, very known, worldwide known pastor who's already in his older age. And the question was asked, how do you stay long with God? Meaning, how do you last in ministry? How do you achieve longevity in ministry? He had these three answers that really impressed my heart. He said, number one, cultivate a relationship with Jesus that feeds you. Not just a check mark, not just a prayer room, but something that replenishes you spiritually. Secondly, he said, have a good reservoir of God's Word inside of you. Not God's Word for a sermon, not God's Word to tell somebody, not God's Word to ease your consciousness or not to lose streaks on you version Bible app, but God's Word for your soul. And thirdly, something he said that caught my attention, he said, never forsake your calling. He said, when you leave your calling, you walk out from God's protection. When you walk away from your calling, you walk away from God's grace and God's anointing. But sometimes life is hard. Sometimes ministry is not easy. Sometimes serving our calling comes at the cost. And we are all tempted at times to abandon our calling as Christians and even those who are in ministry. You know, I look at today our society and I see how many parents abandon their calling of being parents. I meet those people regularly and probably you do as well. And they had reasons. But it didn't change the fact that all of their reasons brought a lot of damage to the kids that they left because they were either busy, immature or addicted to something and they abandoned their calling. For those of you who grew up in a family where your mom or dad wasn't there, whatever the reasons they had for not fulfilling their calling as a parent, it didn't help you as a child. Their reasons in your mind are just excuses. When a Christian gives up on their calling, others will suffer. When a Christian abandons their calling that God has given to them, he puts people around him in danger. Look at Jonah. Jonah did not go to do what God called him to do and it says in Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah ran from the face of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. It doesn't say that Jonah ran from the calling of God because anytime a man and a woman of God runs from their purpose, they run from God's presence because God's presence rests on your calling. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And then he says, lo, I am with you. He attaches his presence to our purpose. He attaches his presence to our calling. I want to encourage each one of you, you have a calling as a Christian. Your calling is the same calling Jesus had. He came to seek and save those which are lost. Your calling is the same the disciples had, which was to bring the message of the gospel of the kingdom into all the world and to make disciples. That is your calling, my friend. That is my calling. You may say, well, this calling is, is only for the pastors or for traveling evangelists or people with a external, with a very outgoing personality. No, this calling, Vlad, is for the extroverts. My friend, the Bible doesn't say go into all, go into all the world, make disciples, unless you are an introvert. The Bible doesn't say go into all the world and make disciples unless you have a business, unless you have children at home, unless you are in school right now, unless you are very busy. That calling my friend doesn't wait and people are needing us to fulfill that calling. One time somebody asked me a question, why would God allow people to go to hell? And I said, I don't understand, what do you mean? God doesn't allow people to go to hell. He sent His Son to die on the cross. He sent His Spirit to live inside of us. He has dispatched His angels to help us on our mission to reach the lost. God has sent the church to reach the lost. God is not sending people to hell. You do. I said, the question is, why do you let people go to hell? I said, God has done everything He could. What else could He do? What God has not done yet that He could have done? Force people to go there? I was like, He sent them you. What are you doing so they don't go to hell? And this person looked at me, he says, well, well you, you don't understand. I'm just not a preacher. I'm just, you know, I'm just busy. I'm just a no normal person. And I said, so you're making excuses. You have a calling. You should be making difference. You should be moving forward, but not blaming God that it's God's fault why people go into hell. I'm not saying it's your fault, but if we are doing absolutely nothing and people are going to hell in the handbasket, my friend, it is not God's fault. It is our calling.
this week I heard a testimony that really blessed me and it's a girl who translated my book into German and she shared a testimony so about last year she reached out and um, she reached out through Instagram and asked if she could translate the book I asked her if she ever translated the book she says I've never translated the book but I would like to give it give it a shot I really feel an impression from God to help fulfill my calling by helping to translate the break free book it took a long time to get that book translated other people were involved last Sunday at this time a day before Sunday she feels the impression to take the book and go deliver it to her brother and put it into his mailbox someone who has been addicted to drugs for 10 years and did not believe in God she didn't want to speak to him because she was afraid of him so she just put the book in the mailbox next morning on Sunday her mom gives her a call and says please come to your brother's house because your brother just phoned me he wanted to commit suicide as they arrived to the house it turns out that the brother contemplating to take his own life went to the mailbox found the book he did not know who dropped the book start reading it and right there in front of his family for the first time in 10 years he repented and he accepted Jesus and instead of taking his life he surrendered it and she replied back she says you have no idea what this means to me little did I know a year ago when I said that I'm going to translate the book that God would use that ministry to save my own brother to bring my own brother to Christ I want to tell you something my friends we are all called to win souls and make disciples Jesus said to disciples who were fishing he says come follow me and I will make you fishers of men he didn't say follow me and I will make you famous he didn't say follow me and I'll make you rich he also didn't say follow me and I'll make your life great he did come to give us life and more abundant but the promise of following Jesus the fruit of following Jesus the consequences of truly following Jesus is not an amazing life it's a life of meaning purpose and significance the whole world is chasing one thing how to make money but Christ wants you to make a difference Christ wants to make your life have meaning more than have money pastor Ilya shared last Sunday the first installment of the series hitting a home run where he talked about vision how vision gives us purpose and purpose gives us discipline I regularly talk to young people who feel unmotivated who say man I just feel lazy I just feel like I I don't have any motivation in my life I just feel like I lack discipline in my life if you lack discipline in your life I'm gonna tell you a secret you don't lack discipline you lack purpose you lack vision the Bible says without vision people perish in other words cast off restraint lack of discipline is a sign that you lack vision you don't need to chase discipline you need to get a vision for your life and the best way to do that is to come to Christ because Christ not only gives you salvation Christ also gives you purpose and Christ gives you a meaning and gives you a goal in life and my friend that goal is not to just graduate from college get married have children buy a truck a trailer and retire at the age of 55 that goal is not just going having a vacation once a year and pay off your home and follow all the seven baby steps outlined by Dave Ramsey program that goal is to win souls and make disciples come on, come on somebody come on. and that applies to all of us not just to the few but to all of us win souls and make disciples to reach our world for Christ for the glory of God I would like you take I would like to take a reading from Exodus chapter 1 verse 7 but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them verse 10 so the Pharaoh said let us come and deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply and it happened in the event of war and it happened in the event of war that they would join our enemies and fight against us so let us so to go out of the land verse 12 but the more they afflicted them the more they multiplied and grew and they were in dread of children of Israel multiplication meaning that we don't just have salvation but we share our salvation now we can't make somebody be saved that's the work of Jesus but we can share the gospel by which they can come to the knowledge of Jesus and then become his followers and with time become his disciples who in return 
can disciple others and bring others to Christ. That's what I mean when I say multiplication. Many of us are multiplying all in the wrong places. Multiplying our weight, multiplying our other stuff, instead of multiplying our significance and influence in the kingdom of God. And it's time to take the right multiplication because we've been multiplying in the wrong places. We were called by God to multiply. If I may remind you, when God created this world, He created the plants to multiply. The fish to multiply, the birds of the air to multiply. The creation were created with multiplication inside. When God created a man and a woman, He also blessed them in Genesis 1 verse 28. It says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over everything that moves on the earth. Humans were called to be fruitful and multiply. God promised to Abraham, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the sky and the sand on the field. He was 70 when God gave him that promise. It took 220 years before Abraham saw only 70 people in his little tribe. Very slow multiplication. Nevertheless, he was moving toward that goal of seeing multiplication. God promised through an angel to Ishmael, and his descendants that he will multiply them. Isaac was promised the same thing. Jacob was promised the same thing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he multiplied fish and bread. He outlined in Matthew chapter 25 that he expects the talents not to be preserved but multiplied. And people who preserve the talent, he called them not faithful but lazy. And the guy who multiplied his talent, he didn't get called successful, ultra spiritual. He was called simply faithful and good servant. I believe it's time for the church to redefine the definition of faithfulness. We define faithfulness as you know I'm keeping my faith brother. Oh sister I'm just going through a very difficult time but I'm just not losing my salvation and that what we call faithfulness. Number one you shouldn't focus on losing your salvation because your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. You are secure in the Lord. God didn't call you to focus on maintaining your salvation. God called you to multiply your influence in his kingdom. Please understand, God doesn't call faithfulness preservation. Preservation, faithfulness. He calls multiplication as faithfulness. Jesus Christ, He multiplied His character in His 12 disciples. 11 disciples, one of them little went cuckoo haywire stuff. But 11 of them caught His heart. The scripture says in Acts chapter 6 that the early church, disciples multiplied. And then it says, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. What am I trying to say? We all are called by God to be fruitful in our walk with Christ and to multiply ourselves and other people by bringing them to Christ, helping them to mature in Christ so they can help to bring other people to Christ who will mature in Christ to help bring other people to Christ who will mature in Christ. That was Jesus' strategy. Now I understand objections right away because you may say, well, that, that, that's awesome, but that's, isn't that what the pastor is supposed to do? That you're talking about ministry Vlad and that's that's for the pastor. Scripture says the pastor's assignment and job is to help the saints to do the ministry. Now pastor is also a believer and he needs to do that as well. He's not just there to equip the saints and never do it himself. Pastor is called to do that himself but the saints are called to do ministry. Some people say well I understand this whole discipleship thing and evangelism. You lost me there. The moment you mentioned it Vlad, you lost me. Why? Because it doesn't apply to me. The reason why it doesn't apply to me is because I already am involved. I already do a lot of things and I'm very busy. My friend, nowhere in the Bible did Jesus say discipleship is only for those who have nothing else to do in church. Nowhere in the Bible does the Word of God say that winning the lost, caring for other people is only for those who didn't qualify for kids ministry, did not qualify for worship team, they do not know the sound, they don't do slides in church, they don't usher, they don't greet. Oh there is that little ministry for those who have nothing else to do and for those who couldn't fit into any other ministry, shove them into discipleship. That's not what the Bible says. I find it interesting that parenting is not limited to people who are idle. Our president is a parent. He has a very stressful job but he has children. President before him, Barack Obama, had children. Why? He's busy. The whole world hangs on him. The most powerful man in the world. He doesn't have time to be a parent. Billionaires have children. 
people who are in college have children. One of my guys who goes to my life group right now is in full-time job, full-time school and he's taking care of four children. Full-time job, full-time school and four children. He didn't say, well, I can't do children. Why? Because I'm in work. I'm working. No, parenting is not only for people who are unemployed. Parenting is for businessmen. Parenting is for billionaires. Parenting is for homeless. Parenting is for unemployed, employed, rich, poor, smart, not so smart. It's for everybody. Nobody disqualifies themselves from being a parent just because they're busy. Yet in church, in the kingdom of God, many of us, we take the parts of about our purpose and about winning the lost, discipling others and we say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Why? Because I'm busy. I'm finishing school. I'm working on my this. I'm working on my marriage. I'm building a house. I just started a business. I bought a new truck. I need to test it. Doesn't that sound like the guy who refused to follow Jesus and refused to come to the wedding feast because they had these wonderful life excuses. I just want to challenge you that winning the lost and discipleship, the vision of Jesus for your life is for your life my friend. If you call yourself Christian that means you're Christ-like and Jesus on this earth he ministered to the masses and he mentored a few people and so there is no way on this God green earth you can call yourself Christ-like yet reject the very reason why he lived and died. There's no way. I'm not saying you don't believe in God. You do. Demons believe in God too. But to say that I follow Christ and I reject His mission for whatever reasons we conjure up in our mind is just not, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't cut it. We believe in the Lord, yeah, going to heaven. But to be His Christ-like, the only thing Christ-like in us is do we believe in God? Do we follow God's calling by surrendering our life to His purpose? My friend, each one of us is called to do that. You must say, Vlad, you're, you're rough. Forgive me, it's been two weeks that I preached. It's all bottled up. <laughs> truth and love. Maybe I'm lacking on the love today, but just more on the truth. We balance, we balance that out by the end of this message. God called us to, to win the lost, to make disciples. God called us to, to live our life with purpose, meaning and intention. No matter which country you're in and no matter which season you're in right now. Sometimes it's not easy because of the seasons that we are in. And that's the focus of the message today. Sometimes multiplication is fun. God blessed them in Genesis 1 verse 28 and said, be fruitful and multiply. Piece of cake, paradise. And sometimes multiplication is pain. Sometimes multiplication is pleasure. Man, you're in the perfect season of your life. And sometimes multiplication is you are in the worst season of your life. Look what happened here. Israel, the Bible says, was afflicted, burdened, troubled. And the enemy did that for this reason. Watch this. Lest they multiply. If they could maintain, he won't attack. The reason why he attacked them is because of the fear that they will multiply. Why? Because whatever multiplies is mighty. The Bible says he was afraid they'll become mighty. See when you begin to multiply you become mighty. When the church begins to grow in discipleship, not just the pastor preaching, but the believers are following the example of Jesus. The church is not a crowd, it's an army. The church is no longer a babysitting, a church is a boot camp. An army of soldiers is being risen up and the church becomes a mighty because it's not just the pastor that is mighty, it's the church that is mighty. And that's why the devil will fight us so that we don't multiply. So we produce baby cows, potato Christians instead of warriors for God. Lest they multiply. But devil I have a news for you. You are gonna fail at hungry generation because there is an army that is rising up. There is an army that is rising up. We're not building a babysitting club. We're not building little touchy, oh you offended me there, you offended me there. No, we're building mature, mighty, strong, 
grounded soldiers in the army of God like these people in Exodus chapter 1 the Bible says the more they afflicted them the more they multiplied what am I saying your calling is not only for pleasure times it's also expected by the Lord to be fulfilled in crisis in painful painful times in times where things are not easy we must understand it takes maturity to multiply in misery it takes maturity to multiply in misery a lot of us who were born physically were not born when our parents had perfect situation for example it's ideal for the parents to start having children when they get their own house when they're financially stable and they finish school but how many of you know that's not reality sometimes you have kids you don't have a house sometimes you have some of you had kids you didn't even have a husband perfect no but kids are still a blessing some of us had kids and we didn't have money at all some of us had kids and the spouse and the husband were not in the good terms at all nobody waited until they got promotion until they finished school until everything in their life is perfect to have children sometimes stuff like that happens in suffering in difficulty and then these children they become such a great blessing that they actually alleviate our suffering by the pleasure of their birth their birth numbs everything else in our life and we rejoice in that miracle of new life what I'm saying is this should we all desire to have better circumstances to have children of course should we plan you know to have children yes children should be desired they should be expected but what I'm saying is the reality of life sometimes that's not how it happens but people what they did with their calling is they postponed their calling to a time that honestly will never happen on this side of eternity once I finish school, once I get the promotion, once I get married, then you get married, like, you know, once I have children, once, once, once and what happens is you're constantly living for the next and you're ignoring the now and God wants you to remember is that your calling is not at some long place, it's happening right now as you are living God wants you to be fruitful and multiply while you quarantine God wants you to begin to be fruitful and multiply when you're gonna come out and your full-time job and full-time school God says I want you to still open your mouth and instead of blaming other people and lying and gossiping and whining God says evangelize share with others about your faith begin to reach out to others why in misery multiply don't enjoy the misery but say listen the misery won't stop me my affliction will stop me my financial problems will not stop me my challenges will not stop me burnout will not stop me business will not stop me boredom will not stop me I will pursue the calling of God whatever the situation that I am in my God somebody give God some praise right now you know Jesus never promised us safety and pleasure Jesus promised us suffering and that promise is alive today true it's gonna be true in every place I know that in America we have enjoyed freedom and freedom is a great blessing unfortunately today many of us have gotten addicted to safety our nation was the nation of freedom and bravery. Today is the nation of safety and cowardness. We have made safety an idol at the altar of which we worship. We have made not offending anybody, our Lord and Savior. Make sure that somebody doesn't get hurt. We are not called to live a life that's politically correct. We are called to live a life that's spirit filled, God honoring and God feeling we are called to be the light in this city we are not called to be hidden under the rug we are called to bring an influence to a dying world to be a salt not to conform to the mold of this world we are called to shed the the faith and the courage and the life of the Holy Spirit that lives in us not to succumb to fear and doubt and cowardness and and be addicted to safety comfort and acceptance of the world who's currently spiritually blind. Francis Chan had a conversation with the pastor in Shanghai and this pastor in Shanghai told him something. He said that when we were hiding as a church because the government didn't let us meet, 
we were thriving and doing great and then one time we finally got the permission from the government to meet in Shanghai and when we did so he said I found out when 2,000 of my members lost their spiritual DNA and Francis Chen asked him what is the spiritual DNA of underground church in China and this pastor whose name I don't know outlined five pillars that the Chinese or underground church has in China and some of you know the church in China is growing as the early church under persecution was growing and he said our five pillars are these devotion to God's Word each individual believer is devoted to God's Word not pastors studying the Word for everyone but they're all learning God's Word for themselves number two deep devotion to prayer and no 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 not that prayer where you pray before breakfast bless the food but deep devotion to prayer throughout the day and commitment to God in prayer number three he says is that every believer is expected to share the gospel and to make disciples that doesn't rest on some departments in church it's the direction of their life number four he said we expect miracles when we gather together in underground illegal church we expect miracles they said we don't have Google on our side we don't have Facebook ads we got miracles and they spread for free, faster and better than any other ad. Church's advertisement has been from the beginning, miracles, signs and wonders. Because when somebody gets healed of cancer, you don't have to pay them to tell other people. When the woman at the well met Jesus, she couldn't keep her mouth shut. She went to all of her ex-boyfriends and their friends to come and meet Jesus. They said, we have miracles and signs and wonders as our advertisement. And the last thing the Francis Chan said, he said, it caught my attention. They said, we embrace suffering. We don't pray against it. Now the suffering the Chinese pastor was referring to is not financial problems, marriage conflict or trouble with children. The suffering he was referring to are not health crisis. He was talking about suffering as a discomfort we endure due to us following Jesus fully. I'm not talking about believing in God because there's a big difference between all the Chinese Christians all they had to do is believe in God and they'll be fine but if they follow Jesus that's when they come under persecution and they said we embrace suffering you know when I listened to that it caught my attention that in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 Paul says to Timothy he says be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ my son in verse 2 he says commit the things you heard you heard from me to other people who will tell it to other people and I'm like yes awesome be strong in God's grace remember your calling tell other people about the gospel and then verse 3 he throws this punch he says and endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ my friend the problem with us with me is that we've spent too much time at the believer level and many of us have not transitioned to the disciple level see a believer comes to the cross to see the beauty of God a disciple gets on the cross to see the dying world the believer comes to eat of Jesus a disciple is someone Jesus says he who follows me let him deny himself pick up his cross a believer learns love thyself a disciple learns die to thyself a believer is somebody who believes a disciple is somebody who dies a believer is somebody who values comfort a disciple is somebody who values the calling of Jesus one is a baby the other one is a soldier and some of us who've been in church for too long who reject any discomfort it causes to our schedule our wallet or our life to follow Jesus as the Lord is not leading me into that please forgive me you're a fat baby that needs to grow up it's not the leading is that you're so good with your diapers and your Christian daycare but you've been in the Lord for 30 years it's time to pick up the cross and lay aside your laziness, lay aside your addiction to comfort, lay aside your addiction to your sin, lay aside your child, childness and say Lord it's time because see you feel that inside of you like man something is missing 
well of course something is missing imagine you being 25 years old running to your mom for her breast yes something is missing that's not supposed to be like that Paul says in in Hebrews he says by this time you should be like teaching others by this time you should be eating meat meaning go killing something and eating it yourself instead of drinking milk by this time you should have your senses exercised so you can discern he says but a lot of you are still babies and that's why the idea of suffering throws us into a cold sweat because many of us now if you are a baby believer it's only been a few months or a year this message is not for you it's for somebody else on that live stream right now just, just relax receive that keep growing in the Lord I'm just talking to those people today who honestly have outgrown spiritually and who have become and developed spiritual diabetes they've really just lost that and, and they keep complaining man something is missing so that's what I'm gonna tell you what's missing my friend you need to become a disciple and the challenge to disciple is not come and believe the challenge to disciple is come and die the challenge to a believer is come and live the challenge to a disciple is come and die and you keep coming to come and live when you have to take a step and come and die and Jesus says the promise is you will find your life more fulfilling when you no longer focus on your life but focus on the Lord the friends uh, not Francis Chan but uh, Samuel Chan wrote one of the honestly best leadership books I've read and in his leadership book called leadership pain he said this reluctance to face pain is your greatest limitation there is no growth without change no change without loss and no loss without pain the best leaders had to endure more pain and many people could never have more influence because they did not have big enough leadership pain threshold if you're not hurting you're not leading ask every parent who's leading children will tell you they have pain ask every boss who's leading employees they have pain you don't know about the less pain you have less promotion you're gonna have so God is saying in order to take you higher he wants to increase your pain threshold that's why Jesus wants to increase our threshold for suffering why because he wants to take us to a greater success in his kingdom God is not trying to hurt us He's trying to develop us, nurture us and to be into His image and likeness. Remember, my Savior, your Lord has scars. And remember, the picture of Christianity is not a beach, it's a cross. We don't hang beaches on the top of our churches. We hang crosses. Some of you wear one. It's time to get one. Get on one. Pick up one. It's easy to wear it. It's another thing to die on it. Believers, they buy them. At groceries disciples they lay their pride their ego their ambition their definition of their life at the cross of Jesus and say Jesus no longer I but Christ who lives in me what do you want me to do Lord I want to live for you not for myself my family lives for you my finances live for you my house lives for you and they're not just singing it like Reverend Hill said he says Christians we don't lie we just sing lies <laughs> And we're so good Lord I give you my heart and then offering basket puts in and we throw a little dollar there come on it's time to be a disciple I know that this is maybe a strong message for some you may be too strong for 11 30 on Sunday morning but God called you to be strong you're gonna make it bring this message to a conclusion I want to encourage you as the enemy used affliction against Israelites so they don't fulfill their calling to multiply the devil will also use I really feel like these five B's to hold you back from winning souls and making disciples we're not just called to hit the ball we're, we're called to hit a home run we're not just called to do something activity we're called to be fruitful the first B is bad experience some of you the idea of discipling others the idea of opening your life group one day the idea of winning the lost has a bad taste for you you're like ah, I tried it I had a bad experience with some people and I no longer am interested in that I have a bad experience who doesn't I had a bad experience at the coffee shop every two weeks I still go drink coffee some of you have seen bad experience of marriages that shouldn't stop you from getting married you've seen maybe bad experience of parenting it doesn't shouldn't stop you from being a parent 
some of you have seen bad experience of drivers you see how some of those drivers drive none of you said I'm giving up my license renouncing my license why I've seen bad drivers you know if Israel would have said well we had a bad experience multiplying Pharaoh is killing us they would have never birthed Moses I remember one time when I did not want to do a calling or didn't feel motivated the Lord said if you let the bad experience stop you right now you will never see your Moses you will never see Exodus you will never see Leviticus you will never see Numbers you will never see Deuteronomy you will never see Joshua you will never see Ruth you will never see Boaz you will never see Solomon you will never see Samuel you will never see Isaac you will never see Isaiah you will never see Jeremiah you will never see Haggai you will never see Mordecai you will never see Esther you will never see Mordecai you will not see these guys because you let the bad experience stop you from going further in God. My friend, God is trying to birth a Moses. Don't let the bad experience stop you from birthing, stop you from going forward because you had a bad experience. Shake off your hands, shake off your feet and say, listen, I'm going to stand and I'm going to go after God and no bad experience is going to take my destiny and take my calling from me. Is bad experience real? Oh yeah. But so is God's promise. So is my future. I still have the best future in front of me even if I had bad experiences behind me. Jesus did not wash off his hands from discipleship and say, well sorry guys, Judas committed suicide, bad experience. So I'm closing discipleship down. No, no, no. He told them go into all the world, make disciples. Judas was bad. Bad experience doesn't stop your best future. It's the first thing that the enemy will use is bad experience. Number two that the enemy will use is burnout. He will use burnout so that we don't move forward. Some people who don't want to do discipleship, don't want to do life groups, don't want to go to them, who don't want to pursue one day to disciple others, generally have just been burned out. Sometimes the burnout happens is because our sacrifice is not replenished with self-care. And then it leads us to self-medication and we just burn out. Sometimes burnout happens because negativity comes for dinner but you gave it a room to stay for life. You just felt negative and instead of shaking it off and reminding yourself of God's promises, you didn't just give negativity a dinner, you gave negativity a room and it stayed and from negativity you became just a negative person who now looks at everything positive through the lens of that negative experience that lingered too long you let it stay. Sometimes we burn out because we really don't do what God called us to do which is to love people. Instead what we took on doing is changing people and after a while let's face it most of us have a hard time changing ourselves. That's why we need the fruit of the Spirit to produce self-control. We can't even control self without the Holy Spirit. Imagine controlling the world. Imagine controlling your children your husband, your wife. That is a full-time without paid job and that will burn you out faster than anything. So it wasn't that the calling burned you out. is you stepped into shoes of God. If you focus on loving people, God will do the growing and Holy Spirit will do the changing. Sometimes the bad experience for some people it's a burnout. The third B that I see that the enemy uses is the burdens of life. It's when life just gets busy when life gets burned out, we get bur burdened by responsibilities that we abandon our calling. And my friend, remember, when you stand before God, you're not going to boast about your FICO score. I'm pretty sure even on your funeral, your kids are not going to be saying, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of my dad. He spent every weekend at the office. Just couldn't be more proud of him. Those things won't matter. Don't let life burden you so much you become unfruitful in the things of God. Jesus warned us in Matthew 13. He says, a seed that falls in the ground that has thorns and thistles, it chokes it. Your life can be choked if you allow burdens to take the center place of your life. The fourth B is busyness. It's when you're too busy. And the last one is boredom. It's when you're not busy, you're just bored to death. And that's when the solution to all of these is no matter if you feel burned out, if you had bad experience, you're burdened right now and honestly your life may be busy or you're bored. Begin to respond to God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? 
begin to move from believing to disciple, being discipled. Begin to move from trying to change yourself to trying to grow. And stop being afraid of discomfort and suffering that following Christ might produce. And honestly, stop hitting the ball. Hit a home run. What do, what do we do? What do we go from now? One, receive Jesus' vision for your life. He has a personal vision for you. You know what that vision is? The same one Father gave him. Win souls, make disciples, touch the world, love God, love people. Number two, make a goal that you will become a disciple maker. Now I don't know, maybe for some of us it could take 12 months. For some of us it might take two years. But have a goal. When you grow up, you have a goal. One day I'm going to have my own house. That's not super successful. That's normal. Have a goal. You will be a disciple maker. And number three, commit to the process of growth. What does that process of growth look like? In our church, we have a very simple process of growth. It's outlined in four stages. Believe, belong, build and become. Believe is when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then you go to the part of belonging. You go to life group, you take a life class, which what used to be growth track, four lessons and one is happening right after this service today at 12 30. I'll reach out to your life group to get a link. And then you go to freedom weekend. It's part of your belonging to the body. Where you get freed, you get delivered. And then the build part is when you get discipled. Now it's like it's heavier stuff. It's deeper. There's more maybe discipline that's developed there. More mindset shift. We do this thing called destiny training which will be revealed very soon. You're gonna hear about it. And then you become, become what? A disciple maker. So start going to a life group because you can't lead others if you don't let others lead you first. You can't feed others if you don't let somebody feed you. The best way to become a good parent is first to be a good child. And God wants you to first go to a life group. And I know sometimes, you know, there are different seasons in life. But no matter how difficult seasons are, you don't disown your family. You don't come to your kids and say, hey kids, just letting you know, work has been hard. School has been difficult. Just not been feeling really well. I'm putting you up for sale. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I'm leasing you out. I'm renting you out for three months. Why? I just need to catch a breath. None of you will do that with your kids. Because no matter how life, how hard life gets, parenting doesn't stop. So is your life with God. So is your life. You go through with God. You go through with your church family and your community. You don't just abandon it. Just because things have gotten a little bit challenging, a little bit difficult. Unless of course you're really hiding an excuse behind a spiritual mask. I would like to invite you right now to take a next step with God. Not just to accept Jesus, but for those of you who've been camping on the Believe platform, to take it to the Belong. And for those of you who've been living on the Belong to the point that you, you too, too belong, begin to go forward so you become built and so you become. For those of us here we're going to rise to our feet as the worship team will come up. As our team is going to sing a song, if we can sing the multiply song, we're going to take our offering right now. For those of you who are watching, you're part of our local church or this is your home church. It's our privilege to give. It's an opportunity to give. It's not a burden and so there's a link below hungrygen.com slash give that you can give through today. We send our tithes and offerings. You can send them through mail or come to the lobby during the work hours and drop it off. It's a privilege. We're not pressured. We have the opportunity to be generous with the kingdom and God. As a church during this pandemic, we are helping families that are going through a difficult time. I had a testimony this week. We heard of a, a member of our church who lost his job, had children and so we, we brought some finances to help them and a few weeks later they recovered. He brings an envelope with, with money. When we got the money we're like we can't accept it. We went back to him and we say this is for you. They said no, no, no you don't understand. When the church helped me, I bounced back. I got a job. I got some support that came in and today I'm give. this is not me returning. I'm just asking you please find somebody who needs this and of course we have families that are in need and so please understand when you give today you're helping us to give to others you're helping us to help others not just keep the ministry afloat but helping us to reach the world for the kingdom of God if you're watching us all around the world you can partake of this as well hungrygen.com give do not miss that opportunity because 
believers they receive but disciples they share they give they share the nature of God the nature of Jesus let's begin to pray right now for our offering father we thank you for your presence we thank you for the purpose you've given us we thank you God that we're no longer babies but God we are sons and daughters we thank you that we are soldiers we thank you God you never promised us safe sailing you never promised us life will be easy but you always promised that you will be with us God and Lord I pray that we will not become so scared God of this world so scared of suffering God so scared of embracing discomfort sacrifice and maybe some pain even to our flesh due to fasting or prayer or commitment to you Lord that we never mature I pray for every person that is giving right now for every businessman and every businesswoman I pray for every mother and every father I pray for every college student every high schooler every middle schooler every kindergarten Lord as we give right now bless us as we bless you bless us Lord from heaven in the name of Jesus in Jesus name as the team is singing send your giving you can also use the church center app to give through or hungrygen.com slash give we will come back right now and do a call for those who are not saved we still need to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior let's worship together as we give <laughs> 